episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show. Today, bringing you a really fascinating guest who is developing a better tomorrow uh, for all of us on, on a very unique area of research. Uh, we have the honor today of being joined by Dr. Ken Powler, uh, who is Professor of Psychology and James Padilla Chair in Arts and Sciences, Director of the Cognitive Neuroscience Program and the Training Program in Neuroscience of Human Cognition, Fellow of the Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease Center and Fellow uh, of the Center for Sleep and Circadian Biology, Northwestern University, Department of Psychology. Uh, Dr. Powler's uh, research uh, focuses uh, on human memory, consciousness, and various related issues. Uh, and his recent research publications with his team have examined uh, various themes, including the role of sleep in both memory and memory dysfunction, uh, sensory processing during sleep, ultimately to help reinforce prior learning. Uh, he studies the neural substrates of conscious uh, memory experiences and ultimately uh, other memory experiences uh, that, uh, such as intuition, uh, which are, you know, uh, can teach us a little bit about uh, the behavior uh, of, of memory and absence of awareness and so forth. Uh, his investigations uh, make use of various uh, behavioral memory, measures of memory, uh, analyses of brain electrical activity from EEG, patterns of cognitive deficits, neurological patients, MRI methods, and so forth. Uh, Dr. Powler received uh, his PhD in neurosciences from UC San Diego. Following undergraduate training at UCLA, uh, he held postdoc positions at Yale, Manchester, and Berkeley. Uh, he is a fellow of the Mind and Life Institute, a fellow of the Association of Psychological Science, journal editor at Neuropsychologia, and uh, program committee chair of the Cognitive Neuroscience Society. Uh, Dr. Powell received Senator Mark Hatfield Award from the Alzheimer's Association and research funding uh, from the NSF, uh, NIH, and other federal agencies and private foundations. And he's just involved in a lot of really cool work and really excited to have him today. But Dr. Ken Powler, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Nice to be with you, Iron. Thanks for that kind introduction. It's it's great to have you. Um, you know, reading through your bio, um, you know, I'd love to uh, start off as we typically do by by handing you uh, the floor for a few minutes just to talk a little bit more about yourself. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up, uh, how you got interested in this fascinating domain, and a little bit of uh, the early career journey. Uh, I think that'd be a great way to uh, to start things off. Okay, well, we'll give it a try. I grew up in West LA and maybe, you know, I've been thinking an interesting little seed that was planted to get me into the field I got into was in my high school at Venice High. And I had a teacher named Mr. Bacho, John Bacho. And the class that he taught led me into my career perhaps. Well, in a funny way, because he taught English, but he gave us readings that were amazing on altered states of consciousness, on meditation, on the details of the brain mechanisms of reading. And I think he, he really was, you know, one of my early mentors in a, in a funny kind of way. Oh, as you mentioned, I went on to UCLA, UC San Diego. I ended up working in the laboratory, Larry Squire at UC San Diego. And that was an interesting time where there are a lot of new discoveries about how memory works through the studies of amnesia. Mm -hmm. so I learned about amnesia. And I also worked with Steve Hilliard in his lab and learned about EEG methods. So I kind of combined those two approaches, looking at human memory, thinking about the deficits that amnesic patients have, and also how can we measure memory function using EEG. So uh, I carried on in postdoc work and did studies with intracranial recordings of EEG, more studies of patients, studies of scanning with MRI and PET, and then ended up in this job here at Northwestern. And I've been studying memory for a long time now. But as you mentioned, now sleep is also an interesting part of my research. And so mm -hmm. the connection between memory and sleep has gotten very important. And I think from those early days, you know, maybe back in high school at UCLA and in at UC San Diego, really I was interested in consciousness and yep. how is this amazing phenomenon that's such so central to our existence and our human experience. How does that come to be? And what's happening in the brain that supports that ability? And so that's 
<laughs> of course, a deep, long-standing philosophical question. And now we have neuroscience to think more about it. And, and so going into memory was sort of a, a way of connecting to that because at the time in the Squire lab, there was new discoveries about memory and how it changes in amnesia. So patients with amnesia, they lose memory abilities, but the classic phenomenon of amnesia is a very selective deficit. So the patient's intelligence can be quite intact. They can be mm -hmm. really with it, have great conversation with you. And so their memory abilities are impaired only in a little circumscribed aspect of memory that's called declarative memory. Mm -hmm. So they have trouble with facts and episodes and recalling and recognizing that factual or event information. But they're okay with a bunch of other things, some types of skill learning, some types of conditioning, some things we call priming, where you mm -hmm. respond differently to a stimulus based on a prior experience with that stimulus or something related to it. And you don't even have to remember that other thing in the sense of recollecting and knowing that you had that prior experience to respond to something different. So lots of types of what you could call unconscious types of memory are separate. And so now we have this nice connection here between types of memory that don't require or don't go along with a conscious experience and declarative memory where you can actually do mental time travel and think, oh, I remember that experience I had a year ago and bring it to mind and kind of relive it mm -hmm. in this conscious way. So that's an interesting clue about consciousness because it says, well, you know, we don't have to compare humans and other animals, but within us, some of our brain function and memory function gives us conscious experiences of memory and some doesn't. Yep. What's the difference now? What's, what's, what defines that change between having this conscious experience and not having a conscious experience? So that's been a longstanding interest of mine to understand that, that clue and how that can inform broader theories about consciousness. But of course, along the way, I've gone into all kinds of other exciting questions about how memory works, what happens when you have a false memory for something that didn't happen, what are the brain events that can help us understand memory better, and, and the implications of that, which could be treating people with memory disorders and figuring out better ways to treat uh, and, and maybe prevent such disorders, as well as how can we do education better? And mm -hmm. what are the ways that uh, we should think about how we learn things and how we can improve that ability? So that's the that's kind of a broad scope of where I've come from. And uh, the sleep part is we'll talk about more, I'm sure, because that's yes. been the most recent interest of you know understanding sleep, the big mystery of sleep, and what happens overnight, and more than just our dreams, and Absolutely. how that is related to everything. Speaking about the sort of these two forms of uh, of memory that you you currently study in the cognitive neuroscience lab, you know, you mentioned sort of the, the conscious recollection about these facts or events that occurred in your life, and you you just introduced us to this concept of priming, um, where we may not be realizing that uh, we're, we're we're remembering something that might be a stimulus that is affecting in some way uh, and, and and reawakening that that memory we have. And you, you mentioned um, amnesia as an example. Um, as and we'll we'll get into sort of some of the, the chronic degenerative diseases of aging of life and so forth, like Alzheimer's, which you focus on. But when when you look at these two baskets, what are some of these? Uh, chronic degenerative diseases, whether the Alzheimer's, the Parkinson's, uh, and, and so forth, more associated with are these areas of conscious recollection that are being hurt. Are, are they priming things, or are they combinations of both? And I apologize if it's a very basic question, but uh, love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, you know, the typical presentation in Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. is just some memory difficulties that get gradually worse. And in fact, as the disease progresses, it influences more and more cognitive functions and the patients have very many problems with, with you know, everything as the disease really attacks more parts of the brain. So the idea is early in the disease, the Alzheimer's pathology is just in some specific areas, often hippocampus and the cortex next to the hippocampus. And then it expands out and messes up functions elsewhere as well. So so that's why we think, well, it's, it starts out as a memory function that's very restricted to declarative memory, mm -hmm. but then gets worse and worse. And, and before, after some number of years, 
that varies, uh, many problems are, are present. But in fact, if you look at the pathology, the neuropathology doesn't really always map onto that kind of scenario, that the same pathology can actually start in other parts of the brain, in which case you have frontotemporal dementia in, instead of the memory problems, or you might have uh, what's studied at Northwestern by Marcel Mesulam and his colleagues, primary progressive aphasia. Okay. Sometimes it's the same pathology, but it hit language cortex first. Got That's the, the first problem is the patient may have trouble thinking of words uh, or using words or with grammar, and then that expands out to, again, become dementia. But in the early stages, it's just a, a very limited deficit. So it's all about which part of the brain is hit. <laughs> And different pathologies do that besides the Alzheimer's pathology. But they, if they hit one part of the brain first, then the early symptoms are restricted to the corresponding cognitive functions that are dependent on that specific brain area. And, and within your portfolio of tools to, to study the, uh, the brain at the, uh, the Cognitive Neuroscience Laboratory, you have you know, very complex functional neuroimaging uh, capabilities, PET, fMRI, and so forth. Just introduce us for a couple of minutes on the types of things. Obviously, you're looking broadly at these electrophysiological changes and the activity in the brain and spiking and, and all sorts of other things that I'm not going to even claim to understand that deeply. But talk a little bit about the types of things in this electrophysiological context that you are studying when you look at these different conditions. And, and we'll get further into that when we talk about sleep and, 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 and other uh maybe pathological dynamics. Yeah, well, certainly there's a huge range of neuroscience methods, but if we focus in on, well, what are the methods we can use in humans? So if we wanna understand human cognition by setting humans, then of course there's a, a, a smaller number of things we can do that are non-invasive, that are not gonna cause any, any trouble for people. And EEG is one of the oldest ones. So sure. looking at the electroactivity of the brain gives us interesting indications about what's happening, but it's kind of from a distance, you know, from outside the brain usually, uh, and trying to understand how do those signals reflect what the brain is doing. And so, for example, in, in epilepsy, a patient might be having this abnormal rhythm of electrical activity, and there's this huge big signal that you rec record, you record the seizure, mm -hmm. and you can see that. Uh, in, in us who don't have epilepsy, sometimes there's still rhythms, and we can look at those rhythms or neural oscillations. There's rhythms that we have during deep sleep. There's rhythms that we have when we're paying more attention or when our visual cortex is busy or not so busy. So these are all the different rhythms that we're looking at and we have to work hard to understand what they mean. And one of the methods I learned at UC San Diego was event-related potentials, a method of looking at activity that's linked with some process like uh, a stimulus coming in. Mm -hmm. And you can see, well, okay, when a flash of light comes, what are the various ways that stimulus produces electrical activity and understand, well, how do those reflect if you're paying attention to the stimulus or not, or if you're actually going to succeed in remembering what just happened or not. And so these are the ways we can kind of extract some information from the electrical activity of the brain. Now, some of the other methods you mentioned, I mean, there's a long list, but we can look at brain scans that give us more anatomical information, but without the millisecond by millisecond timing that we get with the EEG. Yeah. So those are, you know, great, lots of medical uses, MRI scans, CT scans, PET scans, give us different uh, look at the brain structure or the brain function. What actually mm -hmm. is the brain doing during certain circumstances? Uh, and of course, the EEG is about brain function. It's the electroactivity of the brain, which when it, when it happens, also produces magnetic signals. So the yep. MEG is another way to look at, you know, kind of a different perspective on the same uh, electromagnetic fields that are being generated. We have other methods like uh, ones called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Mm -hmm. and with this method, you can put a magnetic field so that it perhaps disrupts networks of neurons and you can see what's the effect of disrupting that area and then taking it away and seeing how does the function come back. So you can sort of do a little damage to the brain that's temporary and then release it and see how that affects things. Or in fact, you can tweak the parameters so that the magnetic stimulation actually helps that part of the brain work a bit better and then also see that. So that's a way of actually manipulating uh, brain function to understand it. And we use other methods that are sensory methods to manipulate. So if we want to 
uh, look at some oscillations in the brain, we can kind of use a oscillating stimulus that will engender more of those oscillations, and then mm -hmm. we can try to understand how they work. So we have, you know, all these sets of methods that are always combined with, well, how do we want to look at cognition? Do we want to measure memory? How are we going to measure it? Mm -hmm. What kind of things are people going to remember? So we bring those all together. And so the field of cognitive neuroscience is kind of taking all those behavioral manipulations and measures from psychology and bringing them together with the neuroscience methods and then trying to understand, well, how does it all work in the case of memory? How do we actually acquire information, store it, and then use it at some later time? So that's a big overview of no, it's all it's, it's, it's tools awesome. That we have at our availability, and even just scratching the surface of some of the other tools that you might think about of studying these things. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, and then once again, thinking of that basket that you just presented, and now in comes sleep, uh, which, as you mentioned, uh, you know, on your website, okay, this is uh, an extremely crucial function. Uh, we don't understand all of it at this point, but we know it's very important. Uh, I'm always told get our, get our sleep. I, I sleep very poorly nowadays, but that's a that's a different story. Um, a couple, about a month ago, we had um, uh, Sachin Panda on from Salk talking about circadian health and introducing us to uh, sort of this this glymphatic system and all this uh, these interesting processes that we're learning about on how waste is filtered out of of the brain when we sleep and other beneficial compounds come in in terms of neurohormones and transmitters and so forth. Um, you're focused a lot, as you were just mentioning, in, in, in some of these very interesting terms, the, the oscillations, uh, the sleep spindles, the hippocampal ripples, a lot of really cool terms here. Um, once again, introduce us a little bit of sort of, as you study sleep as part of this big picture, what are some of the things you're, you're drilling down on? And ultimately, how does this, uh, again, how do you say sort of the connects or the this electrophysiological really cool stuff that you're looking at with all this neat biology that's also happening in there? Well, maybe the starting point is just to think of how is humanity understood sleep? Okay. For forever we've been sleeping. Yep. But what have humans thought about sleep? Well, from the first person perspective, you just know, well, I feel well rested when I wake up, or I had dreams. <laughs> or I didn't have a nice night of sleep. You, but but from the subjective experience, it's it kind of seems like you were awake and then you went to sleep. And then if you had a good night of sleep, then you wake up again and there's just this gap where nothing seemed to happen. And so is it the case that our consciousness is off during that period? And is it the case that our brain is off? You know, when when my laptop goes to sleep and I shut the lid, Nothing happens. <laughs> when I close my eyelids, though, my brain is busy and yeah. our brains continue on during sleep. They're not taking a break. They're not just, you know, resting the way our muscles are kind of resting. So what is it? And, and the brain certainly seems to need sleep. Why do we spend, you know, a third of our time doing that? And what are, why are the consequences so disastrous if we don't get sleep? Uh, so something pretty important is happening that's been a mystery and so the eg was the first new insight from neuroscience to say look actually here's a measure of what your brain is doing during the night and it's not just idling or being quiet but there's activity sure. and there's cycles of activity in different states that you can characterize that we have names for about what's happening during a night of sleep so that's a whole different perspective how does that map onto what you're experiencing well if you're having a dream I suppose you're conscious at that point. So certainly dream, sleep isn't without consciousness because we're, we're conscious of a dream, even if you think you're awake during a dream and most dreams, you think it's a waking experience. You don't realize it. Right, right, right. That's a non-lucid dream. Sometimes you have a lucid dream where you realize it's a dream. And so that's a, a little part of the night. And some nights you might not remember any dreams though you're having them anyway. Yeah. So a funny thing about sleep is that it's got this kind of amnestic component to it that things happen in the night and you very well won't remember them in the morning. Often your dreams won't be remembered in the morning. Uh, and even if you have momentary awakenings, we call micro arousals, mm -hmm. you may not remember that happening at all. So, so, so back to the question of consciousness, are you conscious during all these periods of sleep or are, are, are you unconscious during those periods or are you maybe conscious, but then forgetful? 
the same way if you have some medical procedure and the anesthetist puts you out, well, what does it mean to put you out? Sometimes it means giving you something that makes you not forget, sorry, not makes you not remember mm -hmm. what happened. And you were in fact alert enough to talk to the doctor during the procedure, but not remembering any of it, which is maybe better, yeah. but that's, that's sort of not the same as not being conscious. Right. It's, it's not remembering consciousness. So sleep is like that. Sleep has these periods of brain activity. And, um, and so the, the recent ideas have really coalesced onto how important they are for memory. So I would say sleep is important for many things and we get rejuvenated and perhaps wash out amyloid from our brains, as you were mentioning. So it can be great for many functions. One of the functions we've been looking at though, is the processing of memories and how the things we learn seem to come back while we're asleep without us necessarily knowing it. And our brain is working with that information and perhaps making new connections that are a, sort of a creativity aspect of it as you bring different memories up together and see how they might be related. And that improves our storage of memories and our ability to remember things later. And that's sort of the exciting aspect of thinking about memory now. Now we're not just thinking about, well, something happens and then days or weeks later, you remember it, yeah. but the intervening processing of that information that we're not necessarily aware of happening influences it. And, and I don't know if you're learning something, let's say you're an actor and you're learning your lines, you have to practice them again and again to get really good at it. And so we know that practice is a really important thing for skill learning, for I think pretty much every type of learning, the more practice, the better. But now I'm saying, and practice is happening while you're asleep, whether you know it or not. And in fact, whether you intend to do it or not, and information is coming up and that helps determine what you have later. And so we're trying to use our experiments in the laboratory to get a handle on exactly how does that work? And it hasn't been easy. For example, the, the older literature from decades ago might use sleep, the method of sleep deprivation. So if I take people and don't let them sleep for a night and then test them, they don't do as well on memory tests, <laughs> but <laughs> they're agitated. They had a awful night. They're, you know, not alert. So that doesn't really quite answer the question and remain controversial based on just that method. Got it. So my favorite method now is to just kind of poke, get in there and, you know, I would say tinker with, or, you know, um, use some methods that are manipulating memory processing during sleep mm -hmm. and then showing what effect does that have when people wake up? And what we've been able to show is that when you provoke reactivation of a memory during sleep, people still don't know what happens. They don't have to know, but when they wake up, they're better at remembering the information that got reactivated while they're asleep. And that sort of fits with the idea that the more of this deep sleep you have, the better your memory for what you learned prior to when, she's, when, when you went to sleep. So we're, we're getting a handle on these things and I'm finally getting back to, and it seems to con be connected to the slow waves and the spindles and the ripples, these electrophysiological phenomena. So we have a little, these are like little clues mm -hmm. about what is that memory processing? How can we measure something that tells us more about what the, what, how that's happening and when is it not happening well? For example, in a patient with a memory disorder, part of their problem could be that that sleep part isn't happening, or maybe just people, everyday people who some learn better than others. Some students learn better than others. Mm -hmm. is, is one of the ingredients better quality sleep or more efficient brain processing during sleep that leads some people to have more information available when, when they're awake than other people that aren't doing that well, perhaps because their sleep is impaired in ways we haven't even quite figured out how to measure. So we, we, you know, we want more and more detailed measures to be able to understand what's happening during sleep and understand, you know, this massive activity of the brain. I mean, your brain is always busy while you're awake and while you're asleep. And one of the things it's probably doing is predicting what's going to happen next. And this ability to predict, of course, depends on having learned what tends to happen and you have that inform what you're going to predict that's going to happen later. And so our brain is running through all those scenarios uh, about things that have happened during the night. And I call that memory processing. 
but it's mm -hmm. really just taking all the things that have been learned and trying to put them together and in, in an, an adaptive way that's going to help you have the information you need when you wake up. Really fascinating. And with that, uh, so. Yeah, I've dived right into the. the no, no, it's, it's great. It, it's, that's what uh, I'm excited about, this, these sort of new ideas about memory. Because like I said, I've been studying memory a long time and trying to understand all the different components of it. And sleep is one component that wasn't on our radar so much. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I, I was actually, actually, I'm going to save my question on delirium for after this. I, I'll, I'll, I'll take it right, because you, you, you went into this area, you, you started down this path. So let, let's go into uh, interactive dreaming now and, and this fascinating uh, paper that you published back in uh, April uh, 2021, current biology, real-time dialogue between experimenters and dreamers during REM sleep. Um, you used a variety of external stimuli, including spoken words, tones, flashing lights, tactile uh, stimulation. Um, you know, took a bunch of sort of reports afterwards from you know, when people were awake um, and, and, and recorded sort of what was going on. Uh, did they all, Ken, I'm gonna hand this back to you, but um, in the sort of setting this up for a minute, in, in, in these patients, um, do they all enter a state of lucid dreaming to realize then that when ultimately they waked up like, hey, there was the experiment going on? Or, or did, you ha did they have to lucid dream ultimately? Uh, because I was thinking myself, you know, my wife touches me one time, I'm awake. I'm, <laughs> nothing, nothing else happens. The kids come down the hall, I'm awake. Walk us through a little bit of the model here and exactly what was going on and, and what was reported when these subjects woke up. So, so I, I want to unpack. Take that. your time with it. So, so the, the 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 experimental result you just mentioned is our results with two way communication. So yeah. we're able to ask people a question while they're in REM sleep, and have them answer the question, so that we can be having a dialogue and communicating. And that was our new finding because no one had known whether that could quite be done. Whether the sleeping mind is capable of having a communication. Uh, understanding what's coming in and expressing itself. Uh, and so that's what we were able to do, but I should connect it now to the research I was talking about earlier. So we already learned that we can present sounds to people and improve their memory. Mm -hmm. And I'll use the term we use, targeted memory reactivation is what we call that. So we sort of say we have a particular memory and we target the reactivation of the memory. So people come into the lab and they learn some stuff and they might learn spatial a spatial task where they have to learn where all the different objects go mm -hmm. and they place them on the monitor and they figure out where each one goes and they learn after many many attempts exactly where each object goes but each object has a sound and one object is a cat and this has a meow and the other is a kettle and it has a little whistle so they they it's obvious which sound goes with its object but the point is every time you see that kettle you hear the whistle and you place it on where it goes and you hear the whistle and that allowed us to then, while they were asleep, present a subset of those sounds to the people and see what effect it had. And it did have an effect. The effect was when they got the whistle, it made them think of the kettle while they're still asleep and where it goes. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we make that conclusion because when they woke up, they were more accurate at knowing where it went. So they were more accurate at the location that they learned because they had heard the sound during sleep, which reminded them of where it was located. So in other words, we are able to improve a subset of memories by presenting the sounds during sleep. Targeted memory reactivation is those memories got reactivated and therefore preserved better. And so the memory was better. And we did that in another experiment with learning to play a melody. So we had a guitar hero game. So people are pressing four keys on a keyboard and they're watching these little balls drop down and they have to press the right key at the right time to make a little melody. Mm -hmm. It'd be great if I could show you the video, but anyway, it's Guitar Hero, if you're familiar with that. <laughs> sure. so they learn how to press the buttons in the right sequence, in the right temporal structure to produce the melody. And they actually learn two different melodies. Uh, and then we present one of them during sleep. So what does that melody do? It's not 
that we're testing, do they remember the melody? But actually what they have to remember is, when do I press which finger in what order as those little balls are coming on the screen? Okay. And they're more accurate for the one we presented during their sleep. So essentially we provoke them to reactivate and practice playing that melody while they were asleep. Okay, so that's about memory. How does memory work? How does reactivation improve your memory when you wake up? Mm -hmm. But it gave us a method, which is we can present sounds to people and have them not just get blocked out and also not wake people up, but in between, right. get in there and reactivate information that they had stored in their brain earlier. So having that method, we then went to dreams and said, okay, let's present information during dreams and see if we can reactivate. But more than that, let's try to communicate. That was the idea. So mm -hmm. we used our method of presenting sounds that are not too soft and not too loud and got them in there to influence people to do two things actually. So the first thing we did is let's get a sound that'll provoke people to have a lucid dream. Okay. Now, lucid dreams are something that happen kind of rarely and people have written many books about how to make them happen more often. They're strategies they can use. They're effortful. Ours is a little shortcut because we wait until we see on the EEG that people are in REM sleep. And when they're in REM sleep, then we can think, well, maybe we can enter their dream now with these questions. Mm -hmm. So we present a sound that is connected with learning that they did beforehand. So instead of learning to play a keyboard piece or to know where objects are, in this case, the learning was, think about your present experience very carefully and analyze, is it a waking experience? Or are you sleeping right now and dreaming? Yep. And you could ask yourself that right now and I could ask it and I kind of conclude, oh, I must be waking right now. I think I'm awake. But the point is, if you ask that question to yourself while you're in a dream and, and, and analyze the experience you're having carefully, you can sometimes come up with the conclusion that, oh, actually I'm in a dream right now yep. and have a lucid dream. And once you know it's a lucid dream, it's a really interesting experience because you kind of know everything seems totally real here, but it isn't real because I'm just sleeping and my brain is producing this whole experience. So we get them into that lucid dream state by presenting our sound that was associated with the pre-sleep training. And once we've done that, then we can ask them a question because they're ready, because they knew, oh, if I'm in a dream, the experiment is going to ask me a question and I will answer the question. So they're prepared for a question, but they don't know what question it's going to be. And we told them, if we ask you a math question, you can answer. And the answer might be one, two, three, or four. Answer with your eyes. So if the answer is one, go left, right. And if the answer is two, look left. So hold your head still. Look left, right, left, right. That's a two. Or left, right, left, right, left, right. That's a three. Okay. So they learn how to signal their answer with their eyes. And we Amazing. put electrodes right here and we can measure where their eyes are moving. And in REM sleep, the eyes move a bit. In non-REM sleep, they don't move so much. Mm -hmm. They never go left, right, left, right, left, right. No. <laughs> it just hardly ever happens. So we kind of know they must be answering our question correctly. And then we saw it repeatedly to confirm that, yes, it wasn't just a chance eye movement, but they heard the question and had to understand which numbers, you know, eight minus six was one of the questions. Yes, they understood the numbers. They could think about it. They could do the mental computation. They could know the answer and then they could signal the answer back to us. So that's how we were confirming that it was a, a, a bona fide dialogue. Mm -hmm. We wanted to ask a question where we knew what the correct answer was. <laughs> so now that we have that, we can ask them more questions about, well, what are you dreaming about right now? Are you dreaming in color right now? Are there people there? We can sort of interrogate them about their dream experiences while they're dreaming. And then you can wake up later and find out, well, what, what, tell me more about your dream. But dream research has only had that retro, retrospective reporting. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna know about a dream, how do you find out? Well, you can't yeah. you have to wait till they wake up right. and then they're kind of removed from it and they're quickly forgetting it as if you've had that experience dreams sometimes just dissipate and you kind of lose it if you don't think about it again because you kind of have to be in the waking state to really lay down a good memory for the dream so you you 
it's 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 not a really good basis for science if you can't get get a very good information about it so i think retrospective dream reports if that's all you've got it's hard to study dreams sure. but yeah. we want to connect that with what's the brain activity during a dream and this communication of what do people say, say to our questions mm -hmm. during the dream and use that all together to try to understand dreams better. So I kind of think it's a new frontier for studying dreams now that we can interrogate people in real time about their dreams using this method, which is a tricky method. It's not, it doesn't work every time. So people have to fall asleep in our laboratory. They don't always they have to get into rep sleep. And then they have to actually understand that they're dreaming. Yeah. Not just having a waking experience that's you know, dreams, right? Dreams can be crazy and bizarre and you can be in one place and then be told somewhere else. And there are people there that are like compounds of different people you actually know. And, you know, many bizarre things can happen. And we think, yeah, I'm just walking through this experience. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't get the realization that often that, oh, the reason it's so bizarre is because it's a dream. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we realize that only when you wake up. But in a lucid dream, you realize during the dream, and then it opens up other possibilities. For example, you can then try to push the dream to go in a different direction. You can take control of your dream a little ways, or you can, you know, if it's a nightmare, you can even face what the nightmare situation is and try to figure out what's producing it. Or if you're trying to solve a problem, you can try to think more creatively about the answer. Yeah. Or you could say, I'm going to go ask Einstein what he would say. <laughs> I think Einstein might be in the next room. I'm going to go somewhere. There. And there he is. And you can ask him, you know, so it's, it's your own mind being very creative about things and perhaps opening doors to creative solutions that you might not get in your normal waking state. So lucid dreaming has a lot of potential for uh, being used. And we're kind of keen on using our methods that can help provoke a lucid dream, at least in our laboratory. And where if if we succeed, we'd like to try to figure out how to do that in people's homes as well as well. But it's tricky because ideally we would have a good measure of sleep physiology and know whether people are in REM sleep or non-REM sleep or you know where are they and and then figure out uh, and how do I how do you present a sound that's going to remind them of what their goal was in their lucid dream without waking them up. So it's a little challenging, but I think we're close to some technology that can make progress on that and sort of uh, do some of our experiments in people's homes rather than our sleep lab. So they can have a good night's sleep and uh, still have us tinkering with, or you could say hacking into, we can hack into their deep sleep to change memories and maybe hack into their REM sleep to influence what they're dreaming about. So in that, in that case, it, it's certainly inception. I mean, we're certainly saying, now you're going to dream about math problems. Right. <laughs> and that wasn't what they intended to dream about, but we gave them the math problem. And, you know, one of our, we woke up one of our people in the, in, who was participating in, and he said, yeah, I was dreaming I was in my math class. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of makes sense. You know, it fit with, with the situation. Other people, you know, they hear us talking and they just, uh, it comes like from a voice out of the ceiling or whatever room they're dreaming about. Or one person was sitting in a car and it seemed like the voice of uh, the experimenter was coming from the car radio. Mm. So it sort of gets incorporated into the dream in, in you know, various different ways. But uh, it's sort of fascinating that dreams are open to this possibility. So that's not the traditional way of thinking about dreams. I mean, dreams are usually just... They just happen and you don't know why they happen and they they happen and maybe you can have an intention before you go to sleep i really want to dream about this thing or you know sometimes if you wake up in a dream and it ended before you wanted to end you could say i want to go back to sleep and continue that dream it never so, works for me it but, yeah. so well. no. it works so, so we need we need a little more technology to try to figure out how to how to have better dream control you know um I, I, I might as well go. I was I was going to save that for a couple of questions down the road, Ken. But I, I might as well just bring that. You, you mentioned, um, you know, the the hit Inception from 
uh, a few years ago, Leonardo DiCaprio and, and, and crew. Um, I, I grew up in the, um, uh, the late sixties, early seventies. And, and, you know, the, uh, the hot movie along this, these lines, uh, was from the early eighties was called dreamscape, uh, had, uh, uh, Dennis Quaid and, uh, Cape Capshaw and, and Christopher Plummer was the bad guy. And, you know, it started off that basically it was basically like Ken Powler's lab. And then all of a sudden, uh, Christopher Plummer wants to take it and use it to a, to give people nightmares so bad that they have heart attacks and, and, and great assassination tool and all this stuff. It's a pretty good movie though for the time. Um, but anyway, um, obviously without going into any confidential stuff that you're, you're working on, but what are some of, because, you know, we, we, we do touch a lot on sort of uh, these smart home concepts, smart healthcare within the home. What are some of the things, I mean, obviously we're in this era now where we're starting to have wearables for all sorts of stuff around in terms of ECGs um, and, and other tools that are measuring in the, in the world of the biohacker and, and so forth. What types of things do you think, uh, you know, whether it's five years or 20 years from now, we may be able to shrink down in size and have uh, as legitimate consumer facing tools uh, to have either inception type creative experiences or dream modification or whatever the cool terminology uh, will be. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I followed you exactly. So you're wondering what, what what are the what are the technical ways that we can yeah use, like right talking? now you can do an EC, EK, ekg with this uh what else do you i mean just some ideas of what you think you know the 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 dream hacking tools of, of the of the smart home of the future might look like yeah well i guess it's 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 a combination of monitoring and manipulating right mm -hmm. so what can we measure and how can we get in there to understand. And, and lots of people have sleep wearables these days, and there's a variety of types yep. of wearable technology you can get to monitor your sleep. And it and it kind of gives you sort of an approximation mm -hmm. of what uh, uh, full-scale sleep physiology measures would give you and, and gives you some information that maybe guides you, right? So it can say, oh, I, I got a lousy night's sleep last night. Maybe that coffee I had after dinner wasn't wasn't quite good, or or whatever it might be. So it allows you to take some actions, but kind of based on the information. And, and another step would be sort of more of the real time changing of things. So how can you how can you improve your sleep based on what's happening mm -hmm. right at the moment, not sort of changing your behavior the next day yep. as much as adjusting things. Like I mean, if if there was a nice monitor that could say. Uh, it's a little bit too hot. Let's change the thermostat in your house, cool it off a little bit or, or the other way around. Mm -hmm. That would be nice to monitor, not just the ambient temperature in your room, but you know, in your bed, yep. what is, what is the temperature like and adjust that. So there's some tools and some methods to do that now, but not, not quite working exactly. So, so I guess there's a category of let's make sleep better. Let's mm -hmm. really, you know, Sleep hygiene is all the steps you have to take to get good sleep and yep. add to that. How can you harness some technology to, to do even better in that? But uh, the, I guess you were hinting more at, in addition to that, how do we make the mental aspect of sleep different? Yeah. The dreaming more productive for you. Exactly. Or if you're having nightmares, how do you cope with those to, to, to not be bothered by them as much, or even if you're having PTSD related nightmares, what what can we do about that? And I think that's there's a lot of scope for that. Um, in, in fact, there's a lot of disorders that probably have important sleep components that haven't always been at the forefront of the thinking in part mm -hmm. of treating disorders. And I'm thinking of depression and anxiety, as yep. well as Alzheimer's disease and diseases that have to do with flushing out <laughs> the uh, chemicals that we don't that we need to get rid of. Mm -hmm. So, so a, a variety of things like that. And I, I one of my thoughts about sleep quality is that we, we kind of have a, you know, a, a thin basis for saying what good sleep quality is right now. And we might mm -hmm. say, well, it's seven or eight hours of sleep and it's enough minutes of this type of sleep or that type of sleep. But I'm thinking ahead to, well, sleep quality is also about what type of memories are you bringing up? Mm -hmm. And what are you doing with those memories? 
So sort of the, and that's not so easily measured by the physiology that we have at the moment to say, you know, are you bringing up bad memories? Like if you're, let's say you're, you're depressed a bit and you keep on reiterating some negative thoughts and your days are filled with, you know, keep coming back to this anxious or depressing thought that you're ruminating about. Mm -hmm. Well, I would suppose that you're ruminating in your nighttime sleep period too. Although we don't know about that, so we can't say you're ruminating at night, but there's a good bet that that's also happening. So how could we nudge you off of that and provoke you to do some more positive thinking instead of the rumination thinking that you're doing during your sleep? So that would be a, a way more sophisticated method that we could do at the moment, but it's, it's sort of taking on board. Actually, it's not just sleep quality in terms of the number of minutes of different stages, but it's sleep quality into what actually is your brain doing mm -hmm. during that period? Which information is it bringing up and how is it, you know, how is that adaptive for you or maladaptive for you? And can we correct that a bit? So, um, so that's pretty far out there because we don't, we don't quite have the tools to measure or manipulate those kinds of things yet. But it, it seems like you're on the on the frontier of it, which is real, really fascinating. And it's kind of connected to if just making your dreams better. So I'm thinking a wider scope about what's all the memory processing that happens, whether it's in a dream or not, right. and whether you remember it later or not. It's still influencing your brain function. So that's an important way to think about sleep and dreaming. Is it's it's not just a question of well, what can you remember in the morning, right. but what's the full impact of that dreaming and that deep sleep processing on your abilities the next day, your mood the next day. Yep. Do you feel like you woke up on the wrong side of the bed or are you in a good mood? And can you remember the things you need to remember? Yep. And those are partly a function of what your brain, what your brain is doing at night. Coming back to the interactive dreaming model and, and the sort of the two-way protocol that you, uh, you introduced us to, um, you know, obviously, you know, one of the, one of the themes that that we've touched on a few times on the show over the last year or so are the severe disorders of consciousness, uh, locked in syndrome, persistent vegetative state, coma, and so forth. Um, obviously, here we are with conditions that well, they're not sleep technically, but they're closer to than not. Um, talk a little bit about some of what you see in terms of these protocols and obviously their use modification to, uh, if not wake somebody, but communicate with uh, people in these severe disorders of consciousness. I do think that's an interesting parallel. So in, in the locked in syndrome case, for example, uh, the person might be coming out of a coma, but their ability to behave is just really restrictive. They have no motor action and can maybe only move one eye or even less. but Cognitively, they're intact. So how do you communicate with them? And one of the methods has been used to use uh, MRI scans. So Adrian Owen, for example, had people think about watching a tennis match or think about walking in their house and you get different brain activity and you could kind of ask a yes, no question and get their brain activity since they can't answer you with their eye signals, left, right, left, right. Mm -hmm. they can't, if they can't even do that, brain right. activity could be a measure. So that's when it's, it's kind of a communicating with someone who can't really communicate directly through yep. the usual speech or signaling. Mm -hmm. So there is a parallel because in our, in our communication with dreamers, they're paralyzed, they're in a REM state and their body can't move, but we're taking advantage of the exceptions to that rule mm -hmm. because the eyes still move. And when you move your eyes in your dream body, your actual eyes move. And when you change your respiration in your dream body, your respiration changes. So, you know, you're not totally paralyzed, but, you know, right. a lot of your body is suffering from the cetonia, but uh, certain exceptions allow us to communicate. So in this state of locked in syndrome, the person's motor system is just dysfunctional. So they're mm -hmm. not able to communicate in all the usual manners. And I think our shortcuts, uh, respiration, and eye movements are still not going to be quite so effective for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, perhaps, I don't know if respiration is, is tried as much. We, we put a nasal cannula in, and if you take a couple sniffs, if you go, <laughs> we can sense that really easily. And people make that signal while they're asleep. 
and communicate with us. I don't know if a patient in locked in syndrome could change their respiration to communicate. Okay. That would be a potential alternative measure to have them be able to answer yes, no questions, for example, or multiple choice questions. Um, that's a little easier than an fMRI scan and <laughs> looking at the brain areas that activate during during these different questions. So I think there's some parallels there, but I don't know if there's there's a lot of transfer. Um, we you know we're we're getting into the sniffing method because it's it it supplements the eye movement signal method, which isn't always optimal. Some people you know if you're if you're wandering around in the environment of your dream, you don't you kind of want to keep watching stuff and not busy deciding, oh, okay, I have to move my eyes left, right, left, right. And it kind of puts you out of visual contact with the world a way that sniffing doesn't. Um, all right, so so your question was, can we apply our two-way communication methods to people in locked-in syndrome? Yep. And, and I hadn't thought about that much, but the sniffing method is one possible answer. But really the whole problem with locked-in syndrome is they can't, behave in, in, in maybe any way or hardly any way. So eye movement signaling isn't gonna be an option for them either. Sure, understood. So, uh, so, I, so I like thinking about them in parallel. It's, it's an interesting issue to think about. Uh, and it's sort of, you know, our, our, our cases, we're communicating people who are sort of not in contact with the normal world. They're, they're on another world. I mean, right. it's kind of like communicating with someone on the moon, right? You're, you have this long distance communication and the person in a dream, they're in another world of their imagination, of their dream world. And we're communicating from outside in our world into their dream world and trying to have a dialogue. So it is sort of kind of a long distance type of communication mm -hmm. um, that's, that you know seemed perhaps to be not feasible before. Right. We, we kind of knew people at sleep can make eye movement signals, but we didn't know, could they really hear and comprehend and communicate uh, from inside without waking up? And even, you know, when we, when we did our work with slow wave sleep, the thinking might've been, well, if you, if you present sounds to people, they're just gonna get blocked out or they're gonna wake people up like an alarm clock does. And, and, and we we're sort of hitting that middle ground of, well, we're not going to wake people up, but we're also not going to have it filtered out because, you know, partly when we're asleep, we are kind of not paying attention to the world. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're not totally listening to everything going on, but we're not shut off either because maybe there's a sentry. I mean, maybe, you know, for safety, it's probably helpful to be monitoring a little bit for danger signals. So, so sleep has this interesting component of, well, you're, you're partly disconnected with the world, but maybe there are times when you're not. And in different species, sleep is different because they're different kinds of threats to animals. And you, you, know, you sort of need someone on the outskirts of the society to be watchful all night. Right. So Got who's it. the night watchman right. of your brain? And who's, you know, everyone else being able to have a better night's sleep because someone's on the lookout. So uh, we're, we're perhaps taking advantage of that there's a pathway in, but, and it's often blocked off, but there are openings. Uh -huh. So we, we can get our questions in, we can get our information in and then see what is happening, what's happening in their brain and, and try to, and we're, basically we're trying to make some inferences about what happens in the normal state anyway. Mm -hmm. So even if there isn't sound in the environment, what is our brain doing? What are we thinking about? How is that adaptive for us? Got and, it. Uh, and memory processing, you know, it's, it's, it, we think about it as well. How well can you do well? How, how well can you remember on a memory test later? But of course it's more than that. It's also, how can you use that information to solve the problems you need to solve or to mm -hmm. be creative in all the ways you might be creative? And, you know, I'll tell you about one of the experiments we did with Mark Beeman, who's a professor here who studies creativity mm -hmm. and problem solving. And we decided, well, let's see if we can provoke people to come up with solutions to problems. So he, he and Kristen Sanders working in his lab set up all these little puzzles and they were like little verbal problems or little, you know, matchstick problems, little kind of things that had solutions that aren't quite obvious, but if you think about it, perhaps you get the solution. 
and he gave in, in our experiment we gave people six of these problems that they couldn't solve and if they solved any then we gave them more problems and they, in the end there were six problems that they in, in two minutes each they failed to solve the problem hmm. and then they went to sleep they actually went home went to sleep and while they were asleep and they were in slow wave sleep we presented them with the soundtrack of three of the problems so each each problem came with a little music or some other kind of okay. sound background track that reminded the people while they were asleep of three of the six problems but they didn't know which ones and they didn't know what happened and they woke up and they didn't understand there was music overnight because they were asleep <laughs> but they tried to solve those six problems again and you know what they did better on the three that we had reminded them of mm. so by reminding them of those problems we were able to reactivate those memories and then but we didn't give them the answer <laughs> but they were more likely to then get the answer to the problem uh when they woke up so so memory memory activation is about uh being able to have information but also being able to use it mm -hmm. and and construct you know new answers to problems because sometimes you know you're working on a problem and you you kind of get the wrong answer and you're at a dead end and you're kind of stuck there and you kind of have to unleash from that and think more creatively about some other answer and and so in this experiment uh published by sanders uh in 2019 uh we showed that we could provoke people to be more likely to come up with the answer. Hmm. So I think that's sort of a thinking about what's happening, you know, and, and think about creativity and REM sleep yep. and dreaming. It's right there. I mean, you know, you, we kind of think there are people in society that are really good writers and they can come up with these amazing stories and write books about them. But each of us has these amazing stories every night in our REM sleep mm -hmm. when we dream. Fantastic, crazy stories that we all come up with. And it's part of the creativity of the brain to be able to do that. And, and somehow perhaps connects with our ability to solve problems and be creative in our lives and not just come up with crazy stories, but come up with good solutions mm -hmm. to problems that we're dealing with. It's perhaps part and parcel of the same brain ability. Very fascinating. Really, it's, it's going to be a fascinating coming decade to continue to follow this work. And I mean, really, really impressive. Um, well, I think that, and that last one has some important repercussions because, you know, there are a lot of problems in the world that we need better solutions to. Yeah. And so there's a lot of ways we should try to, you know, work on that. Yeah. But, but one of them could be, let's try to think of how to be more creative in our answers and come up with solutions to problems that we haven't, uh, that we still need to solve. Um, Kim, one more thing I wanted I wanted to come to just uh, once again related to um, your memory dysfunction research and you know beginning you know you spoke of Alzheimer's dementia um, another you know fascinating condition um, uh, that we talked a little bit about in the past on the show is, is delirium uh, and, and I've always been you know amazed by sort of the state of delirium this this sort of the short-term acute confusion and, and and sort of the connection that we sometimes feel when we dream or when we're not having the lucid dream i mean the regular dream and there's that period where you know you wake up and it takes you a little while to realize you know I, i'm not on mount everest right now hanging out with the beatles and you know eating a lamb chop or whatever I, i'm i'm here in philadelphia there's that that period of really deep confusion. And I was just wondering, as you're studying dreams, regular dreams, lucid dreaming, any interesting insights related to sort of the topic of delirium? Because I know this is, you know, we, we've spoken about it from the perspective that um, it's a tough one. It usually confuses people you know, that have dementia. Sometimes clinicians aren't even aware it's going on and it's sort of dementia's evil brother, but that's just not evil enough. But any interesting insights related to the state of delirium via your dreaming world? I don't know. The, the first thing that comes to mind is just to think about how real dreams seem to be. So yeah. I guess in delirium, thing, things aren't making sense. Yeah. And it's confusing and, uh, you know, you're not really making a good, um, uh, having a good understanding of what's happening and your whole mind is kind of disintegrating in its logical abilities. But in a dream, the, there's a, a lot of illogic, but there's a storyline that makes sense. And there's a, there's a sort of a, a, 
you know, like I guess in in um, when you when you talk about uh, some sort of other uh, tools for looking at your reality, like uh, virtual reality, yeah. uh, they talk about a presence. So you you know you really feel like you're there with in a good VR experience. Mm -hmm. And a dream is like that. You yeah. totally feel you're there. It seems real. You're experiencing you know a sensory world that seems totally proper. And this is a little a tangent from your question, but no, it's kind of amazing that that experience seems pretty much similar to our waking experience. So yeah. right now you're sitting in a, a room and you're surrounded by the features of that room and you you feel like I'm there, I'm sitting in this room and this is reality. And you can have the same experience in a dream, but everything's being created by your brain because there is no room. Mm -hmm. You've just created this room based on memories and, and, and creativity and construction. So uh, if we put those side by side, we say, sometimes you're in a waking reality and it seems totally real because you're perceiving the world. Yeah. And other times you're in this dream reality and it seems totally real, yeah. but it's entirely created. So then you go back to the first one and you say, actually, my waking reality is entirely created. <laughs> It's it's not that I'm here in the world. It's that this brain has created this experience of being situated in this world, and I feel this presence, and it's a function of the capability of my brain because my brain can do that during my dream just as well, and I totally feel I'm there. So it kind of takes away, you know, what is what is the real reality of experience? Uh, we kind of think, well, it's because this is the way the world is, and I perceive it directly, and that's why I feel this way. But that sort of misses this intermediate of actually the brain is taking some information and making predictions and correcting them and giving me this experience that's a brain based experience. Yep. And not really just reading a readout of what the world is. Mm. So, that's okay, so that was my tangent off your question. No, no, no. I, I appreciate you said that. Not that anything Go ahead. about dreams. You know, actually, and take a third example. So, if I imagine being in a room, yep. I can close my eyes and say, okay, I'm imagining I'm in my room. And it doesn't have the, the feel of a real experience. You can tell, well, I'm just, I kind of vaguely can see myself feeling in a room and I can try to make it vivid, but it's not the same as actually being in the room. Yep. And it's not the same as dreaming of that experience. So it's, a, you know, an, an inferior little version that we can create. And if you, I guess if you're really good at imagination, you could hallucinate. <laughs> sitting in a room and then it seems totally real and you maybe even forget that it was something you imagined in which case we would call it a hallucination yeah. so there's that third category but you know you, we kind of see this continuum of they're all they're all really just uh functions of what our brains can do rather than uh a, a true thing and a fake thing mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> Fascinating to hear it break it down this way, but it, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, as I said, it's going to be a, an exciting decade ahead <laughs> for you. But it, you know, it's going to be fast to keep watching everything that's going on. Um, what's hot for 2022? Um, obviously, we just started off, but uh, conferences you're going to be at, uh, uh, presentations we should know about, things to follow you, because I mean, it's it's such cutting edge work and and as you were saying we really are on the uh the precipice of something fascinating uh in this whatever you want to call it cognitive biohacking uh the terminology behind it what, what what's other things coming up in 2022 that you want to mention uh please take the floor yeah i, I kind of feel that we're still at this you know beginning stage of opening up and yeah. conferences re really haven't been happening they've been you know hybrid conferences or canceled conferences. And so uh, we're, we're kind of waiting to see if everything on the books for 2022 is gonna go forward as planned <laughs> or kind of have to be adjusted. And you know, every conference you see, there's a little block at the bottom that says, you know, we might change our, we <laughs> might change our plans because sure. everyone kind of knows it's, it's too hard to predict. So I think we're, we're you know, maybe the, the better answer is we're kind of moving to a stage of where we try to get a lot of things done without meeting in person. Mm -hmm. And we have more abilities to 
communicate with people worldwide without having to be restricted by who can fly to a place. So, you know, maybe that's a silver lining of a little bit is, is the exclusivity of certain conferences because you had to be able to get there mm -hmm. and now they could be open up a bit more to anybody, uh, at least sometimes. So, you know, we're still in that stage of, um, using that virtual, um, you know, type of meeting in part instead of the, the, the direct ones. Got it. You know, I guess if maybe a better answer to your question would be though, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to what dream research is going to be like in the future. Cause yeah. looking at the past, it sort of hasn't made its way very mainstream and it hasn't really been increasing in popularity that much. It's sort of, a uh, a, a, a little part of psychology that's been de-emphasized and you don't find it in psychology departments very often and how, how this, this incredible you know, side of humanity, our dreams and our sleep, how, how can it not be given better emphasis given how important it is? And it, it, if you just think of it, well, that's our downtime where we don't get stuff done. Uh, so we really don't want to pay that much attention to it. Then of course it's belittled, yeah. but it's coming back and saying, well, actually it's, you know, and circadian rhythms and sleep and dreaming, they have a lot more importance to our whole life. And maybe they're valuable, you know, on their own as well. But we, you know, we can say, and it has relevance for all these other dimensions of life. So yeah. perhaps we'll see more and more of that. And maybe, so maybe the future will hold uh, a different role for how we think about sleep and, and what we can learn about it. That's, you know, still mysterious. So I, I sort of, I think of dreaming still is this big uh, mystery that has yet to be solved because it's not exactly clear why it's good for us to have dreams, but we kind of figure it must be. <laughs> and, and we have theories, but we don't have, you know, a, a, a really good understanding of what did dreams get us and why, why have humans always been dreaming and, and using dreams in different ways. So uh, uh, I've been one to ignore dreams myself. I mean, I don't keep a dream journal. I don't think about my dreams that much, but uh, it's, it's sort of an interesting dimension of our human experience is that we all have dreams and they're all pretty interesting. Yeah. And what, is, what are they about and how could we make use of them better? And what, why are they there to begin with? So I, I think the future might hold some ways of getting at those questions a bit more and, and who knows what, what kind of uh, answers will come up from that work. Well, I'll, I'll for one, will be rooting you on because I think, uh, uh, we should be putting an exceptional amount of resources and time and money into this space. And, and just as a side note, I am one of those people that it's over here somewhere, but I do own one of those lucid dreaming books, although it doesn't always work. But nonetheless, <laughs> I, I, I'm a big fan, as, as are my, my two sons who have also read it. So. <laughs> um really really great stuff ken um i, I want to you know i'm gonna have you back on hopefully for another episode because it got me thinking of a whole other list of things we could be talking about but um in the meantime it's just amazing work um for everybody that is going to be listening to uh, this particular episode uh, across the podcast networks uh, are watching it on the YouTube channel. You've been listening to the amazing Dr. Ken Poller, Professor of Psychology, James Padilla Chair in Arts and Sciences, Director of Cognitive Neuroscience Program, Director of the Training Program, the Neuroscience of Human Cognition, Fellow of Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease Center, Fellow in the Center for Sleep and Circadian Biology, all at Northwestern University. Keep an eye on him doing truly fascinating work. Ken, I want to thank you for taking the, uh, the time out of your schedule to come do this. Uh, obviously, thank you for everything you're doing there. And as we say on this show, thanks for helping to create a, a very unique tomorrow for all of us via your work. It's it really very fascinating. And thanks for the time. Thank you so much, Ira. Nice to talk with you.